What's up and what's going on, everyone? Thanks for joining us today for the 1004 show. Just ended a great conversation with Chris Shelton, who is the managing director at the Old Dominion University Innovation Center in Norfolk, Virginia. We talked about how to work within a university, work within the constraints of bureaucracies and ways to fill spaces and maybe what the future looks like for innovation centers across the country. This is a great interview. I hope you guys love it. And as always, if you do, give it a like, give it a share, give it a subscribe. Thank you guys so much. Let's get into this episode. All right, Chris, you are the managing director of the Old Dominion University's Innovation Center in Norfolk. That's right. You guys have been open what 12 16 months now officially? officially we opened july 20th of 2016 okay and um so i've been in this position since october of 2015 and it took us uh, several months to get you know up organized running you know get some clients in the door and um, all that good stuff furniture you know make the place look creative and innovative uh, as opposed to its previous use as city offices <laughs> <laughs> so well and i could see with the tree behind you you obviously have a good taste in in trees so oh no that's one of the things i adopted from the city offices <laughs> they left some stuff behind them so like uh, yeah go ahead a, a lot of a lot of groups across the country are looking at opening spaces like an innovation space maybe an incubator accelerator co-working space mm-hmm. walk me through kind of october 15 to july 2016 and kind of what went through all of that? A lot of planning, a lot of building. Like, when when did the breakdown start to really happen? Well, for me, it was a lot of learning, a lot of learning curving, uh, navigating. Well, getting to know and understand the bureaucratic bureaucratic processes involved in a um, state institution, the large state institution. Uh, you know, I'd previously just been in the private sector for you know the the uh, career leading up to that and had just gotten back from two years stint out in Louisville, Kentucky. And so the first few months was spent meeting, you know, all the people in the community like you who are uh, involved in entrepreneurship and uh, supporting that uh, ecosystem. Uh, then it was, how do we get furniture in here? How do we get the walls painted? How do we make this space creative and a place that uh, creators want to be? And is that uh, is that a hard thing because you have to go through so many people to paint the walls, add the furniture? Like, what? Where's the? You, you talked about well, the beer starting with finding who the people are who have to sign off on all of those mm-hmm. things, um, and then all the people who actually can do the work, the work order process. You know, all of you know the university manages a hundred million dollar projects all the time. Um, but a little one like twenty thousand dollar project is, um, you know, it's not particularly a priority for the the folks who are really good at project management. Small potatoes. Uh, yeah, small yeah. potatoes. Um, when I finally did engage them, though, they jumped right on it. I just didn't realize that was a, a resource that was you know really available. Like most of what you deal with in entrepreneurship, you don't know until you know. Mm-hmm. And it's a constant journey of figuring it out. This whole thing is, you know, brand new for the university in general. And so, you know, it's pretty much a startup in itself, Um, an entrepreneurial endeavor for the university in which, you know, I was put in charge of that. So figuring it out has been even still today. You know, we're still figuring that out. So walk me through what the Innovation Center is. It's not just for ODU students or staff. It's an open to the no. public. It's probably more open to the public than it is university-led. Walk me through kind of what what the ODU, ODU Innovation Center is. Yeah, sure. So the ODU Innovation Center is organized under uh, the ODU Center for Enterprise Innovation, uh, which is in one form or another existed for the better part of 20 or 30 years. Um, <clears throat> and they've got six or seven uh, grant funded programs which have historically operated kind of in stovepipes um, and so uh, when my boss Marty came on board by the way this is probably a long way to answer your question but I'll circle back around and, and it'll make sense um, so Marty gets on board and 
you know, we seize the opportunity to be a more cohesive thing and uh, be more impactful to, to the entrepreneurial community. So, you know, he set out to um, bring to fruition an innovation center, which is what we have today, which is a space and programming that support uh, scalable, high growth, innovation driven startups in our region, as well as a co working hub for creatives, um, being like freelancers, uh, those working in uh, graphic design, web design, uh, things that support a remote work sort of situation. Um, and all of you know, that the idea behind that is to bring a bunch of creative, entrepreneurially minded uh, people into the same space and watch the fireworks happen. Um, and for the most part, we see that. When you open, whenever you do something new, a lot of people talk about trying to solve a pain point, solve a problem. What was the problem or pain point that you guys were trying to fix? Hmm. That's a good question. That's why I get paid the big <laughs> <laughs> uh, And being interviewed by by you, who, who is also operating a entrepreneurial support program. Um, you know, I guess the pain point for, well, for ODU is, hey, let's, let's um, get involved in, in the startup culture. We've been supporting medium and, and large businesses, a little small as well for a long time, but not really, uh, not really, sh- identifying the difference between you know small traditional bricks and mortar business up to very large businesses and this startup the idea of of a scalable yeah. innovation driven startups you know there there's really no was no delineation in in uh, thought between the two so really it was there was there was ODU was helping and mm-hmm. being a resource to a lot of different businesses. But now there is this new world, this new buzzword, this new type of business, a startup, if you will. And they yeah. saw a hole in the market and decided that that was something that they wanted to get involved with too. Right. And so that was on, on their side and on the you know community side, there's a lot of programs, yours being one of them, who um, do offer, there's plenty of support out there if, if you're willing to look and get connected um, as a nascent entrepreneur. Uh, there's a lot of resources for small, you know, bricks and mortar, more traditional type businesses, but not really any uh, or many at all that focused on the high growth, scalable, innovation driven stuff specifically and particularly. What, what is a high growth, innovation driven startup business? Well, I mean, the, the unicorns like Uber, Facebook, uh, Google uh, come to mind. But so a billion dollar business. Yeah, something that is um, targeting a, a unique market, or you know, some sort of it could be an innovative business model. Doesn't have to be a technology at all. We've got Hamilton Perkins mm-hmm. in here, and his is not necessarily necessarily a technology per se. It's just putting together, um, you know, fabric made out of plastic bottles and yeah. billboards, and making these beautiful bags, and then driving the business model aspect with his marketing, um, content marketing, social media marketing, and stuff, which is an innovative marketing practice. So sure. I think people overuse the word technology, and sure, people use technology to help grow it. But if you think about the like USPS is a technology, you know, based business, but you need it to grow. Facebook is that, and you need that probably to grow but just because mm-hmm. you aren't necessarily a quote unquote tech business doesn't mean that you can't use tech to help grow that and become a, a very big business sure right? i mean sure. If you th- there's another great example they're not i mean the the technology that they implemented for the most part already existed they just is more of a business model in sure. airbnb as well you know more of a business model innovation yeah and um and we see a lot of that very cool so you guys are what 16 months old now august of 2017 hamilton's done well we had him on the show a couple of weeks ago he's taking bottles turn them into bags what's the what type of support do you guys provide them and like what are the challenges or pain points that he's coming in saying hey i i i'm struggling being able to do this and how do you guys help them become that unicorn or that that high growth business that you guys are setting out to be yeah sure uh, with Hamilton has been 
you know, initially we, we had a lot of chats about the overall business model, what his uh, financial model looks like and business plan. Uh, we urged him to add a zero or, or two to his financials, um, which is just to say, you know, think bigger, think larger, right? Um, In his projecting, you add a couple zeros or what do you mean by adding? Yeah, projecting and and developing a model that supports a larger vision in addition to deciding what that larger vision looks like. You know, ultimately our client's success is in their hands. We can only facilitate and help guide them and of course, we're you know only one or a handful of uh, opinions as well. So we urge them to go out and ask their customers. You know, the whole lean startup thing is very integral in most of our conversations. The business model canvas, um, customer discovery, getting out of the office, and talking to people. Now Hamilton is, oh, I might call him kind of our our prodigy, where he is. Um, he's an executioner, you know, he's really good at his craft and, um, and he doesn't, you know, need a whole lot of hands on, which has been great as we've been figuring out, you know, our larger business model under the center for enterprise innovation that, you know, we don't have to be with him every day or, you know, I mean, we, we have a long conversation maybe once every few weeks at this point. Um, but he, he truly is in execution mode. Um, you know, I intentionally put him in this corner office that has the most uh, street visibility so that, you know, he could sort of treat it as a retail shop. Um, you know, every every angle that we can help, we try to. But we also realize, you know, we have our limitations, too. And, um, and in a lot of respects, we can only help as much as the entrepreneur is willing to ask for it and you know, be upfront and transparent about what their challenges are. One thing that, and maybe you believe this too, but with innovation centers, co-working, whatever they may be, mm-hmm. but a physical space where you're housing a bunch of businesses, do you believe that there is this make-believe look as to what they kind of look like? And so where, where there is all this synergy of people actually working together all the time and talking and, and working at these long tables, and maybe we see them at different places, but... I believe that sometimes we want to see that. And instead, a lot of the things that we're telling our businesses are, hey, get out of this office and go talk to those people. So your space actually might be light, if you will, um, in people in there, even though they're working out of there. But Mm -hmm. because they're not actually physically in the building that day doesn't mean that they're not out being there. And so do do you see that there's like this this make-believe thought as to what kind of that co-working aspect looks like in that? And have you seen that yourself? Um, well, let me let me make sure I understand your question. Are you you're saying that, um, you know, we invite lots of people in to sit down and do work, but you find that the space is actually not um, filled with people because we've encouraged them to get the heck out of the office Right. And talk to your customers, right? Because I think I think you have these leaders, and that leader can be a, a business owner at a big business, or a politician, or or someone that works at a city government, and they see something in New York City where they got this long table that has I don't know fifty people coding away at something, and then sure. I think in in smaller cities like Norfolk or or mm-hmm. it, just any smaller city in general, you don't see that the same way that you do in some of these other places, and so. Yeah. Well, you know, as well as I do, we're still in the middle of building this culture anyway. Sure. Um, you know, getting out, outreach and marketing, getting people to realize that there is another option beside the coffee shop, besides your home, um, that is sort of, it functions just as much as a, kind of a social club mm-hmm. um, a gathering space and, and a place that you can go into be among peers bounce ideas off one another maybe find a client maybe find a mentor or an advisor um, just in passing being associated with a space and coming in there um, several times a week as opposed to yeah I mean I think once we hit that critical mass Who's to say when that'll be? But once we do, then you'll probably see the space more densely filled with people. Um, but yeah, at present, uh, 
we've got you know maybe 12 or so co-working clients and a lot of them do work elsewhere um, for um, a large part of their week I guess what uh, I'm saying is just because you, a space is, I guess what I'm saying is just because a space isn't filled 24 7 doesn't mean that what that space is supposed to be doing isn't happening people sure. have meetings in other places oh and, I, and I, I, I think community like, leaders across the country are thinking one thing and then when they don't see f- people actually congregating at a place they're like oh this isn't working and it's like right you got to be doing yeah, business yeah, and, and they work at different times some come in you know at the middle of the night they got 24 access here uh, I, I like to think of it a lot like a gym right yep. uh, gyms have many more memberships than they have treadmills for um, and oftentimes you won't see but two or three people on those treadmills um, so it's it's more about flexibility both for the space um, and us operating a space as well as the entrepreneur having that flexibility yeah talk about acquiring some of your first businesses so you guys between October of 2015 and July of 2016 were able to acquire some businesses to uh, to bring on these businesses to come into the space what were some of the strategies that you guys brought those those businesses in um, getting out of the office <laughs> Uh, going and meeting as many uh, entrepreneurs, uh, startups that we can in the community. You know, again, we haven't really hit that critical mass like you would find in a major uh, hub like Silicon Valley, New York, um, you know, those kind of places. So just finding them can be a challenge. And I guess that's kind of what you're asking. Uh, word of mouth, networking. Uh, you know, through our colleagues and, you know, other resource providers like Hatch, like 757 Angels, um, you know, building that network, that web, so to speak, so that all of us service providers have at least a cursory understanding of what each of us service providers are doing. And as you and I meet people, we'll send them, you know, to the right spot. Uh, you know, of course, we've launched a website and we've got some social media stuff going. Uh, we could be a lot better at that. Uh, we, you know, one of our challenges is staffing. Um, so having the manpower to execute that stuff, mm-hmm. uh, and you know, being under a university as opposed to a private uh, entity like Hatch, uh, there's a lot of process and bureaucracy that we got to deal with to make any, you know, to. To sh- we can't be quite as nimble and flexible as uh, we would if we were private. And there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, we're a state institution. I have to abide by uh, state protocols, hiring and um, r- revenue. And, you know, to get any, like, work done, like furniture and stuff, we have to put that out to bid. I can't just go to Home Depot. Um, and that and that correlates, again, with the social media stuff, Um you know, it's not as simple as me uh, just buying Facebook ads, right? I've got to go through a process to do that, which is a challenge, but also a blessing because, um, you know, we have we have sort of a war chest that is the university, you know, so it's a double edged sword. So when you have these conversations and building that network, are you let's let's get really down to the meat and potatoes of it. So you find someone. So you find a local angel group. And in this case, it's the 757 Angels. And so you meet with that person and you say, hey, this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And then how do you get that ask to say, hey, I want you to send your clients here because I think it's a good fit. Like, how does, like, what is, what's the wording behind that? Is it easy? Is it hard? Like, do do they bring you a lot of clients? Like, Uh, well, you know, I I get maybe an email every several weeks when Monique, um, the executive director of the 757 Angels, uh, meet somebody who thinks it would be a good fit for the innovation center. Yes, yeah, she does make uh, those connections. Uh, I would like to see more of that, certainly. But you know, you as well as anybody understand that time is very short for folks as busy as us, and I completely understand that. So you know, she's got to go out of her way and you know write an email to make that connection and stuff, and with all of the other meetings and things uh, she has going on, you know, I get it. I get it. Uh, but, to, you know, you just got to make the ask, and I have. Um, and she's agreed to uh, to sort of pipeline for us where it makes sense. Um, and, you know, like I said, by and large, she does. I'd love to see more of it. Great. Uh, 
so you guys recently started something called 757 Pitch, which you found, or you, you, you pitched the idea yourself. Tell me a little bit about the backstory of that, and you guys have only done it once. Um, yeah, so uh, the backstory of that, uh, I went to Louisville, Kentucky for two years, got an entrepreneurship MBA, was uh, somewhat involved in their uh, very much booming ecosystem for a city of that size. How big um, is Louisville? Louisville is, I think I want to say the Met MSA is 1.2 million, something like that. So smaller than the Norfolk region. I could be wrong. I know it's very similar in size uh, to Norfolk. Okay. And also has like, well, there, there's a lot of similarities, and that's what got me so interested in reaching out to, um, to ODU and getting involved in the ecosystem here when I moved back, uh, was that I'd seen, you know, the – the, the beginnings, you know, of which you had a lot to do with, the beginnings of this uh, great cultural entrepreneurial ecosystem shift here, uh, I think Louisville was at least four or five years ahead of the curve. 757 Pitch was an idea that I borrowed from an organization in Lexington, Kentucky called Five Across. Uh, which was five pitches, five hundred dollar prize, five judges, five dollars at the door. I'm probably missing some other fives that they had involved there. Um, but I thought it was a great idea to uh, to have sort of a carrot um, that would bring people out of the bring nascent entrepreneurs working on startups in their garages or wherever, um, bring them out of the woodwork so that we could get them involved in our ecosystem. Um, also, obviously, to build some pipeline for our programs, um, just to have like a, a competition, be it once a year or, you know, with very little or no prize money. Um, you know, I think it's important to have that prize aspect, so, yeah. again, the carrot. Um, and also, you know, to offer them some services at the end, it's not just the $757. It's, Hey, we're, we're talking about bringing you into our center for enterprise innovation, um, uh, community and, you know, whatever it is you need, we will, we will do our best to hook you up with it. Right. So it's really good deal flow for you. So you guys have this event, you get 30, 50 people come in that actually attend the event of it you're getting a handful of businesses that actually are applying for this of which you then sure. take five they get seven minutes and then they get 757 dollars i love that you said the word borrowed that was uh, i need to use that word more uh <laughs> and so what's the follow-up from that like and I, and I know it's a small sample size at this point so yeah. you took the five businesses you give one of them money and then they put them in the system but then how do you kind of bridge them into that next step and yeah. figure out where they should be now, I'll caveat that by saying the the winner isn't necessarily the only one who we will, you know, look at bringing into sure. our programs. Um, if there's others who are a good fit for us, then certainly we'll uh, bring them in too. But uh, in in so we did the first version in July. The winner of that uh, company called Nasoni, um, they are bringing to market a a faucet, a bathroom faucet uh, that has a a water spout similar to like a water fountain mm -hmm. on top with a lever. Um, so instead of, you know, doing this under the sink or, or this, you know, under the sink um, when you're brushing your teeth or whatever it is you do in the bathroom in the morning, um, turn the lever and it, there's a little water fountain. Uh, so he's got a, you know, he's come a long way since the first time I uh, saw him two years ago at Start Peninsula. Um, and great concept. So we uh, were working on, uh, proposal for him. It may already be signed. I'm not sure. Uh, another one of our uh, program managers are working with him. Uh, it turns out that he, his wife has a company, they're government contractors, so they fit in well also with our Gov2Com program, uh, the Veterans Business Outreach Center that's also under the CEI. Um, so we've got, we've identified a number of uh, other participants within the CEI who can provide not only uh, not only consulting help, but also uh, we can underwrite that consulting through the Gov2Com program. So it's like we all rally around this. Let's figure out what resources could he take advantage of? How do we get those paid for? Um, in this case, it's uh, some government uh, grant money from Gov2Com and you know, ultimately 
how do we bring how do we help them come get to market yeah because at the end of the day what matters is is forwarding those businesses and, and helping them get to that next step and not Absolutely. all of them will get there but whatever you can do to get them to that next step so, yeah. so and if they're not going to get there let's help them fail fast sure you know we've consulted recently with uh, a company who has this great idea for a con think about a concrete hut uh that you might set up in a in an uh, area that's experienced a natural disaster or something uh <clears throat> ran through the numbers and it's you know at best three times more expensive than the nearest competitor or substitute um and so yeah our our best advice was to either pivot find a new uh, customer segment or market to employ this technology, but this one is not going to do it. There's just not enough value in, as um, as it relates to the cost of the product. How do you have that conversation with someone telling them their baby's ugly? <laughs> I guess it takes a, a bit of bedside manner, but you know, the we just save them hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in wasted time and effort of going after something for which there's no plausible market opportunity. While I agree with that, it's still difficult to get someone like to not only tell them, Hey, you might be on the wrong path, but then yeah. to get them to actually act on that. I mean, right. Um, well, I, I, sometimes you can, I had a, a few conversations conversations in the last uh, couple of weeks with some entrepreneurs who after pleading with them to consider a different approach to the problem that they were trying to solve that doesn't involve going head to head with some of the largest most resource rich uh, companies in the world um, they were just bent just bent on going forward with it and so you know my hands are tied like i'm our job with my limited time and the university's resources paying for my time uh, it would be imprudent for me to continue consulting with somebody for which i truly cannot see a light at the end of the tunnel if they continue down that uh path and so you know i did my best to to convince them that of uh, going a different way with it. But, you know, we've got to keep an open, open mind um, with most of the people that we meet with. You know, they might seem, <laughs> use the right word here. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I read a story that, you know, Airbnb, when they first started pitching um, their concept that, you know, people thought they were crazy. It would mm -hmm. never work. Right. And look what we have today. So I've got to really be careful to keep an open mind and not let my own preconceptions um, get in the way of what could be potentially a very lucrative business if the right pivots are made, if the right execution. I think there's a difference. though. So, so I'll, I'll hop in to try and help you with this. I think there's a yeah. difference between innovating an, an already existing business and and ideas that aren't solving problems, right? So if you think about Airbnb, yeah. they looked at it and said, hey, there's a lot of empty space in a place. How can we make more money on it? And yes, we're trying to get people to do something that's very different, but people do rent things for a couple of days already. I see this problem as I want to make more money. I have extra space. I don't think they were creating something so, so wild that couldn't be accepted. Now, I get why it was a challenge for them to, to do what they're doing. But the same thing with with Uber is that people are already doing what they're doing. They're just going to be doing it a different way, right? People are already getting into a stranger's car and are transporting back and forth. People are already sleeping in a bed that isn't their own. And so they didn't change that. They changed the way that that happened. And I think there's a difference between innovating something that can be bigger and that needs to be innovated mm -hmm. and someone that's trying to completely start something from the ground up that's never been done before. And I think that's where the challenge with a lot of these businesses have when you're like, guys, like you, you don't even know who your customer is. Right. Sure. Yeah. Or, or, um, you know, in the cases that I was sort of alluding to, I wish I could say more about what the product, um, product is, but, uh, but I won't. 
you know, it's like, what problem are you actually solving? They, they see it um, a lot of times. And this, I think, again, goes back to the, um, you know, that, that we're still building a culture of entrepreneurs that understand this startup game a lot better than, you know, simply considering it as a, you know, a product, right? They think they're, startup is a product this thing that they uh have invented and is the best thing since sliced bread and you can't convince them otherwise um but doing our best to show them that there's a lot more to it than just having this invention having a patent sure. you know you're building a company that ultimately supports brain, putting that into the marketplace, which involves, you know, financials, operations, and manufacturing, if it's a physical product, um, you know, nerds and keyboards, if it's software, uh, marketing, you know, all these things that have to go into place. And if you're not looking at it in terms of solving a problem, um, in terms of a entire system, as opposed to this product, right? I'm just going to build it. I need a prototype. You know, that's what I need. So I'm going to spend 50, I need $50,000 to, you know, get a, a market viable prototype. And magically I'm going to sell a million dollars worth of things in like very unlikely, very unlikely. Um, so those are a lot of the conversations that we have. I hope to have uh, less and less of those conversations in the future because it will, will just be, um, ideally, we'll, we'll just have a more mature uh, ecosystem and, and entrepreneurs uh, that are coming out of the woodworks will have already done some of that, you know, reading and leg, legwork to understand uh, that it is uh, a startup is, well, in Steve Blank's words, you know, the uh, unofficial godfather of modern entrepreneurial theory is a temporary organization um, for the purpose of uh, f of finding a um, butchering it but finding a repeatable scalable business model right like that is your job as a startup entrepreneur is not to bring this particular product that you have in mind to market it is to search and find a repeatable scalable business model right and so you have this product idea and what you ultimately bring to market may be wildly different than what you have on the table before me today. And that is completely okay. And, and, you know, 99.9% .9 likely that it will look very little like what you have on the table. Well, and, I, today. And, and I think that's why people need to solve the real problem, right? And figure out who, who needs that problem to be solved and then try and build something from that. Um, and if you come up with an idea and then you try and find a problem for that idea, yeah, you're taking the wrong approach. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the yeah, the history books are uh, filled with products that were beautiful, but nobody sure. really wanted it all. Um, and things evolve, right? Party. I mean, Facebook today is very different than Facebook 13 years ago. Sure. I like to tell people nothing's ever done. And what about MySpace? What is it called? MySpace. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Well, so how well, do you guys make money? Uh, we make money currently through um, assessing fees on uh, the clients for both the space and the programming um, for the co-working memberships. Uh, you know, the CEI at large, we've, again, got several grant funded programs. Um, we are currently currently looking at ways to sort of reorganize and be more impactful in terms of our mission to eliminate uh, a lot of our overhead and duplicated efforts, for example, marketing and outreach, you know, managing email lists and the blasts, um, you know, for our events and stuff. So each of our CEI programs are the balloon push all that yeah. out instead of each individual doing it. Right, right. And so um, so we're looking at, you know, programs like 757 pitch to uh, attach that, to you know, some city economic development initiatives and have uh, some of our programs funded um, directly through other organizations who are interested in and uh, have a stake ultimately looking at an ROI through being associated with our programs. Um, you know, one idea is you get an angel group to, you know, help 
fund some of these companies at the beginning of our pipeline. The, um, we'll call it phase, a phase one, you know, business model assessment. So we go through a workshop with a, with a startup and draw out the business model canvas, you know, just have a map out what this business model might look like and all of your assumptions on it. And then, you know, force them to get out of the office and validate those assumptions. You know, that comes with uh, time and cost to the university. And ultimately, somebody's got to pay for that, right? So, um, you know, we're dealing with a customer base being the startups who are inherently uh, poor, right? So that's a problem. Um, uh, So if we can get some of those upfront things with these clients funded and, uh, and, and make that uh, gated decision to move forward with the client, maybe take a uh, proposed a revenue royalty, um, propose some, maybe down the road some equity structures, which is you know, very important in a lot of uh, other universities across the country who have these sort of programs and are more mature. Um, they, they fund it through equity deals. Uh, obviously, you see that in you know, accelerators like Techstars and stuff. Um, so if we can get them funded up front, right, get them to a viable business what, model. Funded of what, what amount? Um, you know, we're saying a, a phase one is probably 30 to 40 man hours. Um, so, you know, consulting rates, you know, we'll do some math, five to 10, 10 grand. Per company. Uh, yeah, per company to go through that phase one process, right? And, and then at the end of the phase one, you have a much better idea of whether this has any viability behind it. And, and so you, then, you guys have assumed that the companies that you're looking for, so I'm just trying to pull all this together, right? Yeah, so yeah. Go you ahead, have yeah. driven high growth startups for the companies that you're looking at. So likely they need to have funding behind them to become that billion dollar business. And so then by partnering with a local angel group and having them maybe provide some of the capital to have you guys push them through a pre-vetted company or a series of pre-vetted companies through some sort of programming, right. you're going to be able to help facilitate them to that next level and have them go through you at one step and then go to the next program, which is uh-huh. 757 Angels, I think, in this case, and then move them to that next step? Is that my... Yeah, that's that's a good way to sum it up. And this is all, you know, a dynamic um, sort of model, the way we're thinking about it, too. I mean, we're, we're taking our own medicine. Mm-hmm. So, you know, ultimately, we're looking for sustainability. And, and it's going to... Um, let me let me try and sum up what what the answer to your question is. How are we how are we funded? Um, so it's through fees, it's through grants, and it's through uh, sponsorships. We'll call it that. So you know, if a Norfolk EDA or um, Economic Development Department or Seven Five Seven Angels, you know, wants to sponsor some of our uh, pipeline, um, and thus you know, just making a bet that the, that some of the companies that go through our programs will be a lot stronger for their own pipeline. Uh, for the city of Norfolk, will bring tax base to the city. For 757 Angels, that their deal flow will be a lot more, uh, a lot stronger, right, in terms of uh, matching their criteria for funding, um, that, uh, that there's far fewer holes in the business model uh, because they've worked with, uh, an organization like us to to have some objectivity in looking at that business model, right? It's just it's so easy to just be in the weeds, not to see the forest for the trees, so to speak. Uh, when you're working on a startup, all of the assumptions you make are just that they're assumptions, and until you validate those and have the dogs eating the dog food, you don't know. But it's hard to do that if you don't have anybody like really prodding you. Um, to answer those hard questions. And so that's one of the functions that we serve. Why should someone trust a university to help them grow their business? <laughs> well, um, there's a lot of resources in the university. So what are the, so how do, how do you guys then feed them the, those resources? Um, bespoke. So it really depends. I mean, that's, it depends on what the startups needs, what the company's needs are, right? If you're, um, trying to build some high level, uh, technology, physical technology that needs a lot of engineering help. Um, you know, we'll connect you to the engineering school if it's, um, 
you know, a company that just needs a lot of marketing help, maybe we connect you to the marketing club or marketing programs. Do you guys qualify uh, any of those people? How do you mean? So someone comes in the door, seems like they have a lot of issues or they need, they, they need a lot of things. They need a lot of help. And mm -hmm. your university has the avenues to help them. Do you mm -hmm. just immediately bridge the gap and say, go talk to this person? Or do you put them through some sort uh, of... No. Uh, we will no, no, because that doesn't work. We've got um, we've got reputations to protect. Well, that's right? what I'm getting at, right? I mean, With, and you... external to the university. So if you, you know, if you do that, and the conversation is just a waste of time for the professor or whomever you connect them with, then. Yeah, you know, they're probably not going to listen next time you make an introduction email. So yeah, we work with them and 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 uh, direct that conversation and tee it up just so that uh, conversation they have with professor or whomever is a lot more fruitful and has an outcome, right? And I, I think I think that's important. Of rapport building. I, I yeah, think, I think so many people just say, "Oh, just introduce this person." I'm like, "You have a reputation, right?" That I. I think that's insanely important and not a lot of people talk about it where it's like you can't just bridge that gap. It's one thing if someone goes, I need a lawyer, right? I need an accountant, right? But the, to then put them in front of someone that is going to provide a ton of value and that mutually beneficial introduction is, is, is really important in that case. Um, so it's nice to hear that you don't just introduce everyone right. to everyone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't want to cry, cry wolf, so to speak, right? Because then – then they won't listen to this resource won't listen or open your email um, when there is a really good opportunity that they that they really should be um, be listening to yeah what are your expectations like so with ODU and the innovation center are there specific expectations that are expected out of this space and how long term are those uh, well my boss would probably like me to answer in the affirmative uh, but <laughs> I think it's, you know, candidly, as with most of the startups we're working with, um, you know, might be talking a little more about how the sausage is made than uh, need to. But I think openness and transparency is super important in the community that we're trying to build. And so we've just got to be open and transparent. Um, we're still figuring that out. So the reason know? I'm asking is a lot of spaces across the country fail very quickly. Right? Uh -huh. They get a budget for a year or two, and then they, they're kind of like, a, well, they, a lot of times they are nonprofits, right. and those right. nonprofits get a grant once, and then they can't figure out how to actually sustain themselves, and then they go away. Yeah. And so, so that makes me feel good in, in the situation we're in, where, um, you know, we didn't, this is not started from a grant. Uh, grants come with a lot of strings attached, a lot of reporting requirements, a lot of overhead. Um, and so when you get a, one of those grants, you basically pigeonholed yourself into a m more specific business model um, than is probably appropriate because it takes a, an extreme amount of flexibility to flush out all the uncertainty in an endeavor like this and to remain flexible until you figure that out. And I am 100% confident that ultimately we will. Um, and it probably, uh, it's like, how do we solve global warming? Well, it's not through solar energy. It's not through wind energy. It's not through, it's through a combination of all of these things, right? So a combination of those grant programs, combination of sponsorships and, uh, and you know, hopefully client fees, uh, whether assessed up front in cash or in terms of royalty or equity. Uh, it's going to be a combination. I'm not going to answer the question on how to fix global warming because I have no <laughs> idea. We're talking with Chris Shelton, the managing director of the ODU Innovation Center in Norfolk. That's Old Dominion University. So what is next? Knowing that you guys are trying to create this sustainable model that mm -hmm. can help these businesses for a very long time. What 757 pitches out now. Like, What's the next thing that you guys are working on to, to continue? <clears throat> um. I've, I've been working on getting you in here for a while. <laughs> um, we're, we've gotten on board with um, 1004, so that's adding some value to our clients. Uh, I did not pay him for that plug, by the way. No, he didn't. No. Um, no, we're excited about that. Uh, shoot, what was the question again? What's next? Like, what do you, what's next? 
Um, what's next is hopefully one of these innovation centers in all of the major cities in Hampton Roads. That'd be great. Why um, is that important? Uh, well, I think it's important to build to to encourage and build that critical mass, right? Mm -hmm. um, having this one center, you know. Alternatively, we could we could have well, alternatively or in addition to have a uh, a concept of a super hub in which we would just be one of uh, many programs within the same physical space, mm -hmm. right? So we'd have. Uh, the hatches of Hampton Road 757 Makerspace, um, maybe several different co-working spaces, 757 Angels could have offices in there. I'm really excited about that prospect. Uh, we may be quite a while away from something like that. Um, but as far as ODU, having an innovation center um, in Portsmouth, Chesapeake, Virginia Beach, you know, moving up to the peninsula, Hampton and Newport News, um, I think that that's the direction that we want to move forward. But again, we are keeping in mind that flexibility is extremely important and um, and we're happy to remain flexible. So let me ask you, maybe this will be the last question. So knowing that shopping malls are dying, mm -hmm. right? Your, your traditional um, shopping mall in Norfolk, Virginia, it's the MacArthur Center, right? I'm not yeah. saying the MacArthur Center is dying, but I'm just saying like these malls in general – are dying. There's a guy, I think his name is, um, there's a guy that goes around and films going through these, um, these shopping malls and they're, they're dying. It's interesting. Right. So knowing that that physical space game in an old industry like retail is dying, what makes you think that the space game in innovation and entrepreneurship is also not going to die along with the, with the building, uh, in, instead? Oh, well, I'm not convinced it wouldn't. <laughs> You know, I, right? Because people say like, I have this, a, I have a laptop. That's all I need. And then people are building these buildings around this physical yeah. space. Right. You know, it's it's tough. I think our customer segment makes it extremely, extremely tough, especially in an environment like ours where we have not hit that critical mass. Um, it is not particularly mature in terms of venture capital and seed and angel capital, and so you know, without, without capital to prime the pump, you know, you and I get really excited about this. We have great conversations. There's, you know, several dozen of us that are, you know, would love nothing more than to see this, this, this awesome culture, you know, just be erupting like a volcano. Uh, but you and I don't have millions of dollars in funding. Um, you know, I've, I was in a presentation with this guy by the name of Chris Hively that was one of the co-founders of MapQuest. You probably know him. Um, started a thing called, uh, what was it called? Down in, in the Durham fort. area. The Fort? Something like that? It was the book he wrote. Uh, it was Amer the Foundry, American Foundry, or something like that. It was Anyway, it was this startup uh, accelerator incubator thing in Durham that he started up right. with his millions and millions of dollars of exit um capital from from MapQuest. Uh, so, you know, they had this guy who started and it ended up being, uh, from from all I can figure, pretty darn successful. And they had, you know, several exits come out of it. And, and that was great. But they had somebody who was willing to put the up startup the, factory, the startup factory yeah. um, to put up the capital and prime the pump. Uh, you and I not having that sort of capital, uh, you know, it is in the region. You know, we've got to do a better job of working with those who have both the capital and the interest. Mm -hmm. um, you and I have talked about and know some of these folks uh, and, and get on the same page that they're putting that capital and interest into the things that the startup community actually wants and will use. So back to your malls thing, right? Um you know, the companies that and, and entities that own the malls and the property that malls are on want ROI, mm -hmm. right? If, if we're, our target market is um, poor entrepreneurs who need to sink every dime they have into their business, not real estate and fancy stuff, uh, you know, that's really, it's kind of a mismatch there. And we've got to fill that gap. And the only way I can see to fill that gap is through some sort of major external funding partner so, or plural. So why pick winners or losers? What do you mean? So 
Because winners win? And... No, 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 no. So you're, you're making a bet on a few businesses, right? A lot of the things that are being talked about are taking a lot of money and betting on a, a sample, a, a small a small amount of businesses, right? Oh, I was talking about in terms of a mall. So let's say, say we seed fund this mall thing where you have lots of uh, nascent entrepreneurs in who – you know, haven't figured out their business models right. and a lot of them will fail. Um, Cause the whole know. concept behind 1004 is to yeah. really, is to help everyone, right? Stop saying to say, okay, I like this person because they presented well at seven, five, seven pitch. Now I'm going to sure. throw everything onto them, right? Us right. saying, let's sprinkle a little bit of fairy dust on everyone. <laughs> and then progressively you'll find the ones that become that next big thing. But if you, right. if you go after and try and choose just a handful of businesses Instead of all of them, you're missing out on potentially a lot of those businesses that could become that next thing. And a lot of people might not even be talking about. Right. So that is, that goes back to the vibrant community and ecosystem, right? We can't be everything to everyone. Sure. None of our, no business can be everything to everyone. Um, not even Google, you know, they've had a lot of ventures that have, that have failed uh, because they can't be everything to everyone. And so I don't think it makes sense for us, the university, um, to be playing that role when we have Zach Miller in 1004 playing that role. Um, I don't know if it makes sense for us to be playing, you know, heavily in UAS, unmanned systems, when we have Peninsula Technology Incubator sure. um, swimming in that pool. Uh, so building this continuum of care that's threaded throughout the regional entrepreneurial community is so important in that we can just like how we instruct or, or um, advise our clients, like really hone in on a niche customer segment, at least at first and nail that thing, right? Nail that segment. Um, and so the segment that we uh, have chosen is the innovative, scalable, you know, high growth stuff. Um, I love that 1004 sprinkling fairy dust on lots of smaller companies um you know a lot will fail a lot will never take off sure. a lot will decide that hey there's a much bigger opportunity behind what we're doing and when they you know get to that point we're happy to bring them into into our barn i think that's fair and i appreciate that because you know really find your focus and then own it and then go after it hard right right and so you know us when we hear someone say something against what we're doing we're gonna fight for our right to party, basically. And we're going to go after that really, really hard. And I think that's owning it and saying, no, this is why this is important. This is why we need to do it. And you're right. It's not going to help. It's not going to please everyone. And you're definitely going to find some people that might, you know, be, um, as Taylor Swift says, you know, haters going to hate. And that's okay. Yeah. Because you know who right. you're, you're fighting for and you can build, you can build for them. And so you've developed, so with 1004, you know, you have this, uh, uh, digital platform, which is inherently very scalable. Uh, we at ODU Center for Enterprise Innovation have lots of people with immense amount of knowledge and experience in um, in all sorts of things, um, you know, between this business model stuff to engineering, everything in between. Uh, but we are, you know, the clients that we have and the services that we provide are very labor intensive in terms of our time. Right. So in order back to how do you connect with other you know, professors and programs within the university, um, you know, it takes handholding. It takes really getting to understand the individual startup, their market, their business, their needs, their challenges to make that informed decision that is inherently not scalable. Right. So there for inherently we have to make bets on um fewer than you can right sure. with a very scalable digital platform that's fair if someone was in your position and they were trying to or so, or as an organization at a school and they were thinking about maybe starting an innovation center or you're a city and it's looking at maybe getting into the incubation world what are, what are some tips that you would provide them hmm uh <laughs> Again, I'm stumping you. This is this is why yeah. I get paid the big bucks. Like, read the lean startup to begin with. Okay. Pick up a copy of Business Model Generation. Uh, listen to some of Zach Miller's podcasts and 1004 stuff. Scour Google for other 
um, facilities and programs that you're interested in starting up. Uh, join the INBIA, International Business Incubation Association. Talk to those people. Do exactly what it is that you intend to instruct clients to do. Customer discovery, you know, business model development stuff. Eat right? your own dog food. Eat your own dog food. And, and, you know, get out there and just do it. Start um, teeing up those com- – you know, this is – the Innovate, ODU Innovation Center started really a year or two before it actually opened, right, with those initial conversations, Marty going out there and um, talking to city representatives. Yeah. Uh, this I, I hadn't mentioned it before, and I feel bad for it now. This is a partnership between the city of Norfolk and ODU. Sure. Uh, so the city is uh, funding the space, and they have you know their economic development folks coming and meeting with our clients. Um, oh, cool. and so, you know, he teed that up with the city and they liked the idea and yada, 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 same, the same steps that any startup would go through, we have gone through. And, and that's what I would, you know, start with the lean startup and give me a ring. I, I appreciate that. I don't think enough centers, places eat their own dog food. They read it in a book and that's it. And so I love that you're saying that Chris Shelton Managing Director at ODU Innovation Center in Norfolk. What's the website that people can find you guys at? Oh, funny you should ask. We just launched a new version uh, yesterday. ODUinnovation.com. Awesome. ODUinnovation.com. We'll have that in the show notes as well. Yeah. If people want to find you, we'll have Facebook that. Facebook and Instagram at ODU Innovation, I yep. think. All right. Yeah. We'll, we'll plug all those links as well. Chris Shelton, I appreciate your time and continued success with the center there in Norfolk. Hey, right on. Thanks, Zach. It's been a pleasure. Oh, yeah.